Hey, how's it going everyone? It's Blake here from ChessPathways.com, and in today's openings video, we're going to be talking about the Stonewall Attack. The Stonewall Attack is a Queen's Pawn opening, and it's better understood by learning the idea instead of a specific move order. There's a couple different move orders that can be used to reach this, uh, this attacking setup, but the general idea is White's going to put the pawns on F4, E3, D4, and C3, really trying to clamp down on this e5 square, often white's going to hop a knight in there later and try to play for a kingside attack. For example, d4, d5, e3, knight f6, bishop d3. This is the move order most often associated with the stonewall attack. White's just delaying playing knight f3 because they want this f pawn to advance. Let's say black strikes at the center with c5. And white could change course and try to go pawn grabbing in some cases when black plays this early move c5. Uh, there are some lines where white plays d takes c5 and tries to hold onto the pawn, and then it's almost like a queen's gambit with reversed colors. Um, but that's not often what player who wants to play the stonewall attack has in mind. Often white's going to continue with their plan, play c3 to reinforce the center, and then play pawn to f4. And now we have one of the main starting positions of the stonewall attack. Now, in the stonewall, there's not very often going to be any early tactics. So it's a lot more important to understand the ideas here instead of memorizing specific lines. So let's talk about what both players might have as plans uh, in this position. We've talked about what white wants. White wants to make sure that e5 is impossible for black to play, really clamp down on this square, maybe use e5 for a knight at some point, and later on to build up on the king side. We also notice one of the downsides of this pawn structure is that this bishop's really locked in. Very often, white has to play bishop d2, bishop e1, and then maybe bishop h4, trying to activate that bishop somewhere down the line. So we've talked about white's plans. Let's talk about what black might be planning to do in this position. One of black's ideas might be to use this e4 outpost that white has created. White's already pushed these pawns to d4 and f4. White's never going to be able to control e4 with a pawn again. So this could be a very important square for black to control, and black might want to hop a knight in there at some point, just like white wants to hop into e5. I've even seen some games where black can just be very methodical about this. First black trades the light squared bishops off, then black slowly routes this knight to d6, and then hops a knight into e4 where it can't really be dislodged. Sometimes black even plays f5 themselves at some point, creating this kind of symmetrical pawn structure, often followed up by knight e4. If black's not going to play one of those ideas, then they often have to come up with some kind of pawn break. One idea might be to storm the queen side with pawns. It looks kind of slow, but a plan involving, you know, b5, a5, b4, just grabbing a bunch of space on the queen side and trying to open up lines there has been effective in some games. And secondly, a more explosive pawn break would be f6 followed by e5. That's really the only way to get e5 in, but that can be an effective plan, especially after black castles trying to blow open the center, and maybe expose this uh, potentially weak e3 pawn after the e-file opens up. So, those are the plans. Let's go ahead and get to the moves. I just pulled a sample line here to really illustrate some of these ideas. Um, black can play here bishop to g4. Often black doesn't want to lock in this light squared bishop with, uh, with e6. Uh, you certainly can. We're going to take a look at that later. But often black wants to develop it actively before playing e6. So, bishop g4, knight f3, e6, castles, bishop d6. All very normal developing moves. And one move white could try here is queen to e1, simply unpinning this knight so white can play knight e5 at some point. And if white can play knight e5 now, that might kind of strand this bishop too. This bishop would be kind of in no man's land. Uh, white could quickly think about expanding on the king side, maybe even playing queen h4 to come after that bishop. And white could even follow up with moves like g4 in some cases, really trying to build up this attack. So often here black plays the bishop back to f5, that's one of black's main goals, too, in the Stonewall, is to exchange light-squared bishops. This is really white's good bishop, with all the pawns being on the dark squares. So eliminating this bishop is really getting rid of a powerful attacker white has, you know, in his arsenal. And black's not too afraid of these double pawns most of the time. These double pawns would actually be pretty nice for black. That would open up the e-file. Black could pressure this backwards e3 pawn. It would really take the e4 square under control, so black's not really afraid of that. Often white does not oblige black, they just keep developing, queen e2. And here black would consider playing c4. Now this often isn't a move you want to play, because it takes all the pressure off the white center. But it can make sense, you drive this bishop back, and black might be thinking about going for their queenside pawn storm ideas, trying to blow open lines on the queen side. So this particular game continued with bishop back to c2, castles, and now white tried knight to e1. White's just trying to free this queen from defensive duties of the bishop while still not giving in and letting black open up the e-file. And potentially white could be thinking about expanding with g4 or just swinging this knight around to f3. 
But either way, you start to feel like white's kind of losing their way here, and black has the better position. Bishop takes c2, knight takes, knight e4, black gets to use this nice e4 outpost, knight d2, and in this game, black decided to play f5 like I talked about, and end up with this symmetrical stonewall kind of pawn structure here in the center. That said, this tends to favor black, because black's bishop's better. Black has the dark bishop when all the pawns are on light squares, and white has this pretty bad dark bishop here on c1, really hemmed in by his own pawns. So after knight takes e4, f takes e4, bishop b2, knight e7, bishop e1, there's that plan I talked about, this bishop's trying to swing into the game. But the knight takes up this nice square here on f5. It'd be pretty risky to drive it away with g4. Um, white goes for it anyways, though, because there's really not much else white can do. White would have a very passive position if white can't expand. So white played g4, which grabs some space and kicks away the knight, but it also exposes some squares here around the king. So knight h4, threatening to come into f3. Bishop has to take, take, g5, and rook f5. And white might have a space advantage, but black is definitely fine here. In fact, I think black probably has a slight advantage. This king's just pretty exposed, and it's pretty clear that white's attack on the king's side isn't really going anywhere. All of black's pieces are getting into the game. So there was a sample line that illustrated a lot of key ideas in the stone wall. I'm just going to show you a couple other ideas that both sides could try to implement. So one, coming all the way back here to move three. We talked about playing c5 here with black. Um, some players might not want to allow white the opportunity to take on c5, so e6 is another move, just blocking this bishop in for the time being. So let's say f4, c5, c3, bishop d6. And here's another common theme in the stone wall. If white were to play knight d2 here, black should be looking out for a good opportunity to take on d4. Often, you don't want to take on d4 because that lets white take with the e-pawn and really free up this bad bishop. But here, white's not able to take with the e-pawn because f4 would be hanging because of this move knight d2. So in this case, white would have to take with the c-pawn and still have this e-pawn hemming in that bishop. Now black might look to get play down the open c-file later in the game. So it's just a good pattern to remember. Look for opportunities to take on d4 when white can't maintain the pawn structure they want. They can't take with the e-pawn and really free up the bishop. They have to take with the c-pawn and still have the backwards pawn. You might be wondering how black plans to deal with getting this light bishop into the game after they lock it in. And sometimes in this pawn structure, the bishop even comes to a6. So here's another sample line coming back to this position. We talked about how c takes d4 is a possible idea. Black could also consider playing b6, just trying to trade off white's powerful light bishop for its rather poor counterpart here on c8. Black just wants to play bishop a6 and trade off light bishops, which would really cripple the white attack in some ways. White here often plays queen to e2, just stopping bishop a6 for the time being. Let's say castles, knight g to f3. And I was surprised when I checked this position in my database, because often black was playing knight b to d7, or knight c6, or bishop b7, um, kind of giving in and giving up on this hope of exchanging light bishops. So to me, the most obvious move was pawn to a5 just grabbing more space on the queen side, and once again threatening bishop a6 with the help of the rook. And I couldn't find any games where this particular position was reached. I know this idea is a, is a common one in some similar openings, but I, di I didn't see any games in this exact position. But I checked with the computer, it seems to like the idea, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised no one's played it here. I understand you're giving away the outpost here on b5, and white could try to control that, but I think it's worth it to exchange light bishops, because now bishop a6 uh, seems very hard for white to stop. So, okay, that about wraps up our summary there of the Stonewall, really covering the main strategic ideas. Now, this is rarely seen in professional chess these days because black has adequate defenses against it, and we've seen how black can get a pretty good position, the e4 square can be weak, the bishop can be bad. But in amateur chess, it's still pretty popular because if black is not ready to deal with this attack, white really has this ready-made attack coming up on the king side. There are some opening systems specifically designed to give white an improved version of the Stonewall attack. For example, let's consider the Torre attack with d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, and bishop g5. One of white's plans in this opening is to finish development, play c3, e3, bishop d3, knight d2 castles, and then later play knight to e5 and f4. And you get this same Stonewall pawn structure, but the difference is your bishop's not locked in. Uh, because your bishop's out here on g5 from move 3. So the stonewall structure can be reached from many more openings than just the stonewall attack, so it's very important to understand this structure and how to play it for both sides. Thanks for watching. Please make sure you visit chesspathways.com and get signed up there. It's totally free, only takes 5 seconds, and I will send you a free move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking. 
when you sign up. It took me way too long to become a chess master, and I want to help you do it in a fraction of the time. Thanks, and I'll see you there.